just yeah yeah it was uh, yeah I, I don't want to tear up before we go on the air but it was it was really meaningful for me so thank you guys thank you for us too I'm Jennifer Rooks, and this is Maine Calling. The rapid rise in COVID cases and hospitalizations may have peaked. Today, we'll talk with Dr. Nirav Shah, director of Maine's Center for Disease Control and Prevention, to learn the latest on the pandemic. Thank you again for joining us, Dr. Shah. Well, it's, it's a pleasure to be back with everyone. Good to see you all. And Dr. Shaw is here to answer your question. So we invite you to join the conversation. As always, we expect to have many, many questions. So please make them brief. If you send an email to talk at mainpublic.org, you can post a comment on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram, or give us a call 1-800-399-3566. If you do call, think about what you'd like to ask Dr. Shaw and think about how you can ask that question fairly briefly. And a note, this program is being streamed on Maine Public's YouTube channel and Maine Public's Facebook page. Dr. Shaw, what is the latest? We just heard Erwin Gratz say that hospitalizations are up. Everybody was so excited last week to hear that the rate of hospitalizations had been falling and falling kind of significantly. And then all of a sudden, boom, some bad news. You're right, Jennifer. Um, you know, right now, where we are with respect to the pandemic, I would characterize as, as better, but still bad. Uh, things are not where they were when we were at the peak, say, in the middle of January. They have eased off a bit from that, whether it is hospitalizations or, for example, the positivity rate or things like the amount of COVID that we're finding in wastewater samples, something that we can talk more about throughout, throughout the state of Maine. We're not at the peaks of the middle of January. Uh, things have eased on all of those, not as much as any of us would have wanted, to, wanted them to ease. And I suspect that this is what we're going to see going forward. There will be some days and weeks that are better than others. There will be some degree of ebb and flow, some weeks higher, some weeks lower. But that's the nature as we move towards some degree of steady state COVID-19. COVID-19 is not going away. It will be with us. So we have to have a hard conversation as a state, as a country, as a globe, about what the goals are of what we're trying to do now. Is it to eliminate or prevent every single case? Probably not. That's probably not feasible at this point, given how much COVID there is out there. So then what are our goals? Are we focused primarily on reducing the severity of illness, i.e. minimizing the number of people who are on a ventilator? That seems reasonable. I think we're focused on trying to reduce the number of people who are critically ill through some of the newer therapies that we have. And then of course, focused on keeping the most critical aspects of our society open, whether it's schools or hospitals. Those are the conversations I think as a country we're going to be having as we all start thinking more about the newest buzzword, which is endemic. Mm. Let's talk about the testing you just alluded to, this wastewater testing. Um, I know that you talked about it last week at the press briefing, that bringing more towns and communities online, starting that testing. Is it soon enough? Have you, have you already gotten some of those results in? Can you, can you tell us what the data from that testing is, what we're learning from that already? I, I, we do have those data and I can share it. So wastewater, to zoom back one second, wastewater testing has been utilized for other infectious diseases for many years in different parts of the country, different parts of the globe, for polio and other such things. It's a common way of understanding what's going on at a community 
or population level. It was used earlier in the pandemic just with COVID here in Maine, but many municipalities backed off of it, particularly, for example, over the summer as things really eased. But as things started getting worse with Delta and more recently with Omicron, we at the Maine CDC have been working with municipalities to bring it back on. Some municipalities like Yarmouth had it going. Others are, are now resurrecting it, like Portland, Bangor, et cetera. Our plan is as follows. Maine CDC is working with approximately 20 municipalities across the state, uh, geographically, diverse groups of cities across the state to do this wastewater sampling. And we've started getting results from that over the past few weeks. And what we've seen, going back to the, what I think may be the theme for today, better but still bad. We've seen in almost all of the municipalities that we've started to see test results from, things going down. The levels of COVID-19 in their systems are falling dramatically. And those typically, typically, but not always, preview a reduction in case counts in the days to come. We're hoping that Maine follows the pattern of other places, South Africa, the UK, where cases fell shortly after, for example, wastewater levels fell. Wastewater surveillance is a really useful tool for us because it doesn't depend on people taking the active step of going to get tested. It's just something that we can scan at a community level to tell us what's going on and where we might be going. When you say it's falling, is it falling dramatically? It really is, Jennifer. And I will, I will make a note in an attempt to post some of those data uh, so folks can see it. But it is not just falling. It is falling dramatically. And that's a good and hopeful sign. We're hoping it is met by a reduction overall in things like hospitalizations. The other thing we are seeing, though, is not just in Maine, but in other parts of the country, a lot of folks are starting to be hospitalized, have always been hospitalized, but now more so are being hospitalized, not for COVID, but with COVID. We're working with hospitals to get a better sense of what that number and what that percentage is. But with so much COVID around us, everywhere in the community, it shouldn't surprise anyone that someone who is admitted to the hospital because they slipped and broke their ankle or their arm shoveling over the weekend might also be found to have COVID as they are admitted. So we've got to make sure we start to disentangle these things, which is what we're starting to do at the main CDC. I wanted to ask you about that. My understanding is that some states, for example, Massachusetts, are trying to disentangle that data. And so that when people are reading statistics about hospitalizations, they understand the difference between people who are admitted because they have COVID and that person that has been admitted for something else and then test positive for COVID. That's exactly right. And we're, we're working on that same not to disentangle. It's a difficult one because... Uh, a lot of conditions are greatly exacerbated by COVID. So if you come in with a heart attack, but it turns out you've got COVID, well, that's a different type of clinical picture than if you had just had a heart attack alone. If you come in for that hypothetical uh, shoulder surgery because you were injured yourself, the surgical team really needs to know if you've got COVID because it may alter your care. For example, the type of PPE that people wear or whether to have the surgery at all. So it's not so clear cut. Um, and we've got to make sure we do it in a thoughtful manner so that the data that we generate tell us what we're looking for. Right now, hospitals are still under strain. And that's really the key. Hospitals across Maine, as I've, as I've taken the time to chat with them, they are under tremendous stress and strain right now. And so on some level, if you're a hospital, whether someone is admitted for COVID or with COVID is not a distinction that has immediate consequences because your hospital is under strain either way. But as we start thinking about the future of COVID and understanding how the disease is changing week by week in our state, knowing that difference will be important. We want to make sure that when we roll it out, we do so with a methodology that's thoughtful and generates answers to the real questions we've got. Dr. Shaw, we're learning about yet another, um, now it's being called a sub variant of Omicron. Is it, are you referring to it as BA2? 
tell us what you know about this. Um, am I referring to it the way it's going to be referred to? And how worried um, are you about BA2? We are referring to it as BA2 at this point, but they may attach a different moniker to it at some point. But you're right, Jennifer, it is, it is not a new variant as such. It is one of the various sub-branches that grows from the mother Omicron variant. So if anything, it's a sibling of the current variant of Omicron that is here in Maine already. This new one that you noted, BA2, has not yet been detected in Maine. But as we've seen with every other variant detected elsewhere in the globe, it's only a matter of time before it finds its way here. Here's what we know about it. In some countries that have seen it first, for example, Denmark, as well as India, it appears to spread very rapidly, perhaps even more rapidly than the variant of Omicron we're dealing with right now, which is called BA1. So that's a concern. However, let's talk about what, when we talk about infectious diseases, what we're accustomed to thinking about now. Contagiousness is one element, but how severe is it? And how well do the vaccines stack up? There, the, the news seems to be more reassuring. BA2 does not yet appear to be more, um, more lethal or cause a more serious illness than the current strain that we're dealing with right now. It also appears that because it is a sibling of the current strain, the immune system protection that we've generated, either through the vaccines or from prior infection, will also protect against BA2. But I want to stress, we are in the very early phases of our understanding of it, much like we were right after Thanksgiving with Omicron and right after the 4th of July with Delta. We will learn much, much more about BA2. Some of this may change, but this is what we know about the broad strokes right now. Can you address the very common idea that's going around that you may as well get Omicron rather than get something worse? Well, you know, you're right. That, that is something that, that I've seen and heard folks say that based on where we are right now, all of us have a date with Omicron. Our goal is to try to make sure that not everyone's date is the same day to keep the healthcare system going. But the, look, it's everywhere. And so you may as well just get it and then move on. And so that if something else comes down the pike, you're protected. And I have a few responses to that. The first is that there is a certain almost rhetorical irony in the notion that you should get something in order to prevent yourself from getting something. We don't know if the next thing you get will be worse. We also don't know if the thing you get today, Omicron, will even protect you against the thing that may come down the pike, Rho or Sigma or Tau or whatever Greek letter that we may happen to be on. But the other piece is that we have a vaccine that after a booster works exceedingly well at protecting people against the worst effects of Omicron, 90 plus percent after a booster. You know, the thing is, there is this notion, Jen, that is a companion to the notion that you outlined, which is that Omicron is mild. And I think that deserves some context and qualification. Omicron is milder, but not mild. We still have 300 plus people in the hospital, a number of whom, almost you know, 90, who are in the critical care unit, a number of whom are on ventilators. Omicron may be milder than Delta, but it is in no way mild. And as a result of that, it's not something that I would recommend that anyone trifle with. Again, and Jennifer, you and I have talked about this even if you believe you may in fact be just fine with Omicron, first of all, you might not be. But second of all, can you really say that about every single person in your life that you might spread it to? Your parents, your grandparents, your elderly neighbors, can you really say that every one of them would be okay? I don't know anyone who could say that. Mm -hmm. Dr. Shaw, I want to come back to Maine and ask you about the testing backlog. Where are we with that? Well, 
Jennifer, and, and, and I'm glad we're raising this because I do want to talk about it. It, it is not a testing backlog per se. Um, by testing, you know, it, some, some, someone may get the impression that there are a bunch of nasal swab samples that are sitting at our laboratory waiting to be run. That is not the case. The backlog of samples, I'm sorry, the backlog that we have is not of test samples that are waiting to be run. It is the results of those tests that we have to process and send a note to, to the US CDC. The tests have been run, the results were positive, the patients have been notified sometimes three times by their doctor, by the lab, and by the main CDC that they are positive. So huh. no individual out there is waiting for a result as a result of the backlog. All this is, is a server in our, in our, in our building that has results that we have to type in the all the data for and send to the US CDC. Now we're working on that process to automate it. The reason we are where we are right now is that Maine is one of the last states that still believes that case investigations and their, you know, and, and the, the process of calling folks uh, to check in on them and see how they're doing has value. With Omicron, that may be turned off soon because of how much COVID there is. But this backlog, which we are working to automate, is not of test results. I'm sorry, it's not of test samples. It's just of the results that we have to send up to the US CDC. And Jennifer, it's, it's part of a bigger discussion of what are the metrics that matter in this moment. Right now, it, it is our view that the things like the daily case counts, the change in day-to-day -day numbers of new cases is not what tells us what's going on. It's much more things like the wastewater sampling we talked about. It's much more things like hospitalizations. It's less day-to-day -day at this point and much more week-to-week. -week. The trends are what tell us where we are, not the day-to-day. We're speaking with Dr. Nirav Shah, the head of Maine CDC, about the trajectory of COVID-19 in Maine and all the latest information. We're going to take your calls and questions when we come back. This is Maine Calling. Listener support brings us Maine Calling with help from the Maine Souvenir Shop. Committed to supporting Maine artists and designers, Exchange Street in Portland, Instagram, and mainesouvenirshop.com. Maine Public is proud to be Maine's storyteller, amplifying the stories and voices of Maine for the last 60 years. It's essential work that we are proud to do because we know how important it is to be connected, especially in times like these. This is a team effort. We're here for you today because generous listeners have been there for Maine Public for 60 years. On Wednesday, we'll open the phone lines for our warm-up drive, and we'll invite you to join our neighbors in supporting the service that you rely on. If you'd like to make your contribution before the campaign officially starts, you can do so right now at mainpublic.org. Thank you. There's a lot going on here in Maine all winter long. Concerts and classes, lectures and literature, fairs and festivals. How can you connect to it all? Maine Public's community calendar. It's easy to find things to do. Search by type of event, date, or location. And if you represent an organization and want to let Mainers know about your event, it's easy to enter the details on our online form. Maine Public's community calendar. Bring the people of Maine together. Visit mainepublic.org and click on events. Welcome back. This is Maine Calling. I'm Jennifer Rooks. Our guest today, Maine CDC Director Neerav Shah, here to answer your questions about Omicron, vaccinations, COVID tests, and what to expect in the weeks ahead. Share your comments and questions by email, talk at mainepublic.org, comment on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, or give us a call at 1-800-399- 3566. Dr. Shaw, I'll start with an email from Katie because I think that this is something every pe a lot of people would like to ask. If all the members of my household are vaxxed and boosted, how risky is it eating at a restaurant? Dr. Shaw, are you eating in restaurants? The first um, of the Dr. Shaw, what are you doing questions? <laughs> well, no, that that is, I think that is one of the most common questions that that, that I get to. You know, and um, I'll answer it. I'll answer it straight on. You know, my, my family and I are are not back to restaurants yet. Uh, 
uh, partly partly because we like to cook at home and so on and so forth, but also because uh, we're not we're just we're just not quite there yet. Um, here's here's the thing though, there is no such thing anymore as something that is uniformly and universally safe or unsafe. For some families, being completely vaxxed and boosted means that going to a restaurant, totally fine, completely something that's tenable. Other families may, although they, the core family, the nuclear family may be vaxxed and boosted, goes to visit an elderly uh, parent in a nursing home every weekend. That may be a different calculus. Um, and so my family's not there yet, partly for the reasons that I noted about our interactions with elderly parents. Um, but for other families, uh, if you're vaxxed and boosted, particularly if you're somewhere in a restaurant with good ventilation, so, so on and so forth, th that is these days something that can be done safely. And that's a testament to just how good being vaccinated and boosted is. The vaccines are just that good. And recent data suggested that after being boosted in particular with the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine, no matter what you got the first time, your levels of protection against being hospitalized or severely ill with the Omicron variant are so good that they are in the single digits, if that. So, um, you know, we, we are at the point now where every everyone is going to be moving at the highway at a different speed. But yes, for some families who are fully vaccinated and boosted, that's the sort of thing that can be done with safety. We'll go to Ellery, who's calling from Waterville. Hi, Ellery, go ahead. Hello, and thank you for taking my call. Uh, great questions, great, uh, great answers, and I thank you very much. Uh, I've heard through some uh, news sources a very disconcerting report of fakes, 95 N95 masks out there, and I was wondering, are there any home tests to determine efficacy or or is there a way to determine if a mask is genuine or not? Because I've, I've, I've got, there's a few I've purchased. I'm, I'm sort of kind of doubtful about them. Ellery, that, that, is a, that is a great question. And it's come up within, again, my own family. Um, there is not a test per se to determine whether the mask that you have purchased is in fact counterfeit or not. For certain healthcare workers, when we issue them an N95 mask, we ask them to undergo a process called fit testing, which does determine the fidelity of the fit and the utility of the mask on the person's face. But that's not something that you at home should or could do really. So for you, for folks who are at home looking to buy an N95 mask or what I wear a KN95 mask, the way to go about that to ensure something good is to start with a good supplier, to start with a good source. And I won't name any names, but there are a number of supplier companies out there that are dedicated to the process of vetting their supply and only selling bona fide masks. Uh, there are a number of them. I myself have found them by looking first from at some reputable news sources that have done a great job of compiling them. And these are, in some cases, nonprofit organizations that are solely dedicated to making sure that the masks that they turn around and sell are completely vetted. So rather than having to deal, Ellery, on your end with vetting whether the mask you got is good and proper, I think the better approach is to go straight to a reliable source from the get-go. Ellery, thanks so much for your call. We'll go to Larry calling from Bangor. Hi, Larry, go ahead. Hi, Dr. Shaw. Um, you know, a million years ago, I was a, uh, a surgery tech and there were times that I had to spend uh, three days working without stop. And so we didn't take uh, the oath that you had to take. Most of us were very dedicated. My daughter is now a uh, sonogram tech. And she, she's reporting to me that a number of the people in our hospital are getting to the point of schadenfreude with these people who refuse to mask and refuse to take vaccine. And yet they still come into the hospital because they're sick. Somehow this needs to be addressed. I mean, it's uh, like I say, my daughter has not indulged in that. And I certainly wouldn't indulge in that. It's getting to the point where people are just totally fed up with these idiots that don't mask or take the vaccine. Yeah, Larry, um, I, I appreciate that. And uh, I, I think the sentiment that you that you reported that 
your daughter and perhaps, well, not your daughter, but other healthcare workers have been feeling uh, that sense of where are we and that schadenfreude of how, how could we be here? And, and I've, I've even seen folks who take some measure of, you know, look, we, we told you so. It, it's, it's easy to succumb to that notion. As you know, Larry, uh, it, it does run contrary to the entire ethos of healthcare. And that's why I think uniformly across the country, Larry, even though in private, some healthcare workers may vent that frustration, when it comes time to doing the job, it does not matter how the person in front of them got to where they are in the hospital. It does not matter to every single healthcare worker I know, whether the person that they're caring for with COVID had gotten vaccinated and is having a breakthrough case or didn't get vaccinated at all, because the professional ethos of, of modern medicine is to care for the person, not, not to focus on the story that brought them there. That being said, if you are someone out there who is worried about our healthcare system, if you're worried about the strain and the stress and the anguish that healthcare workers are feeling, there's something you can do. And that is to make sure that everyone you know in your family, in your life is vaccinated and boosted. There is a direct line between the anguish that healthcare workers feel and the fact that they have to care for many people who are sick. What, what generates that I don't think is anger. I don't think it's frustration. I think it's a sense that COVID now is a vaccine preventable disease. And so healthcare workers see a patient in front of them and they can't help but think that this could have been avoided. And for a healthcare worker, that is I think what motivates that concern. It's not that they are upset necessarily, it's that they are contending with the patient who didn't have to be there because COVID is now vaccine preventable. If you don't wanna put healthcare workers through that anguish, the best thing you can do is to be an emissary for vaccines with your friends and your family. Thank you, Larry, for your call. Um, I wanna to go to an email here. Let's see if I can find it now. <laughs> This is an email from Gordon. If we are beginning to see endemic COVID, what does this new normal look like for everyday life? Yeah, you know, Gordon, I think a lot of us, the word endemic came into our lexicon and we all glommed onto it because it has the word end right there in it. And I think a lot of folks think, oh, endemic, that means the end of COVID. I'm on board with that. Let's do that thing. Unfortunately, that is not what endemic means. Endemic effectively means that the status quo is something that persists. To flip that around, if the question on the table is, are we endemic yet? The next question attendant to that is, if the status quo of today were to continue, is that something that we'd be okay with? And I think the answer for right now, for today, January 31st in Maine, is not yet. We have almost 400 people who are still in the hospital. Some fraction of them, 90 of them, are in an intensive care unit bed. So although we all want COVID to move in that direction of endemic, i.e. end, we're not there yet. So what does endemic look like? Well, to an epidemiologist, what endemic means is that the, the wide variations that we may see from day to day, week to week, are smoothed out. And COVID becomes and joins the other infectious diseases that Maine CDC receives reports of on a daily, if not weekly basis. It's something that we contend with. If there are significant outbreaks in say nursing facilities, we begin to investigate those as we would with the flu or others. Endemic essentially means not that COVID has gone away because that is not happening, but that the worst effects of COVID are things that we stand ready to spot and mitigate. It's gonna take a little bit more time and a lot more planning for us to be there, but that is the direction as a country that I know we all wanna head. We'll go to Mike calling from Clifton. Hi, Mike, go ahead. Hello, um, I've got two quick items. Uh, one is, as a, as a horse owner for almost 40 years, I'm very familiar with the 
the preparation ivermectin uh, for treating parasites in equine. Uh, and I do know some people that are accessing that <clears throat> preparation through actual MDs. I think it's foolhardy. It says right on the the paste uh, not to, and the injectable for cattle not to be used by humans. And I just wanted to know how that ivermectin got even into the uh, – the idea that someone could use it for, for the treatment of COVID. And the second quick thing, after watching NFL football all weekend and seeing the uh, tens of thousands of people packed in these stadiums without masks, yelling and screaming for three or four hours, I just wondered uh, if Dr. Shaw was a public health official in the Midwest or in California, how would he be viewing those events? And I'll, <clears throat> I'll uh, hang up. Well, th thank you, sir, for both of those questions. Let me start with ivermectin. Uh, you know, ivermectin, um, those who, let me, there are, there have been data that show that ivermectin for certain diseases is remarkably effective. Indeed, the drug was created by Merck or discovered by Merck many years ago and was useful in basically reducing, if not outright getting rid of a disease in many poor parts of the world called river blindness. Now that disease is not a virus, it's a different type of parasite. But there have been some studies that have shown that ivermectin has some activity against other viruses. And early on in the pandemic, as folks will recall, we were grasping for any treatment that might work, whether it was remdesivir, which does work, ivermectin, which doesn't, or chloroquine, which also doesn't. But there were some very early and admittedly confusing studies those studies, those early results were studied in the manner that is the gold standard, the double-blinded, randomized trial. And when those trials were done, and that's the gold standard in clinical research, they showed, unfortunately, that ivermectin didn't work. But for a lot of folks who are grasping at anything that will help them, they'll take it, even if it may not work. In this case, we know it doesn't work. What's pernicious about ivermectin right now is that there are, notwithstanding the fact that we know it doesn't work, there remain licensed physicians who prescribe it to patients and give them a false hope at a medical cure. This is unacceptable because we actually do now have treatments that have been shown to work. Two of them are oral medications, one of, and two of them are injectable medications. They actually do work. So to prescribe a medication that we know doesn't work in light of the fact that we have medications that do, that doesn't work for me. Now, with respect to the larger sports events, you know, th they do raise some concerns. Um, I think some of those concerns can be mitigated. For example, you know, the, both the game in LA and the game in Kansas uh, were both in outdoor-ish stadiums, still a lot of people packed together, but a lot of ventilation by virtue of the fact that there was a lot of air movement. Um, I, I think we are in this phase now where will there be COVID cases that result from those games? Possibly, maybe even probably. But we've got to start asking ourselves, if not now, then when? And now in the midst of an Omicron surge, I know there are folks that will say, definitely not right now. However, we have to recognize that there are mitigating factors with both of those games. Again, the fact that they were outside, the fact that many people who were there may have been vaccinated, although we don't know. Um, I, I don't know that uh, it's something that I would have attended, to be honest, but I understand that for a lot of folks, that's something that they would want to do. And um, I can see where they're coming from. Mike, thanks so much for your call. I'm going to combine a couple questions here because they're related. Um, here's an email from Deborah. The talk about fully vaccinated is concerning me. I am immunocompromised and over 65. Due to circumstances, I initially chose to get the J&J &J vaccine and then chose Pfizer as my booster. Do I need to get a third booster? I can't get a straight answer from my medical provider and I'm concerned about both my health and that of my husband. And then Christine on Facebook says, there's very little info out there anymore about how protected you are with J&J &J vaccine and a booster. It's always two jabs and a booster. It's like the J&J &J never existed. So let's, let's talk about where, the, where we talk about um, how we think about 
um, boosters, particularly as we're thinking about fourth doses. And Jennifer, we'll zero in on the J&J piece first. Uh, the J&J vaccine, thankfully, has continued to be studied even after it first came out. In fact, just almost exactly a month ago, a group of researchers in South Africa published a paper, not just of the original J&J, but with the booster as well. And what they found, thankfully, was that the, the booster with J&J continued to perform very, very well. That's good news for folks who got J&J early on. However, at the same time, if you did get J&J early on and you're thinking about what to do for your booster, we now also have data to suggest that mixing and matching is a good strategy. So if all other thing, everything else is equal, if you got J&J early on, when, you're, when, you, when it's time to go get your booster, getting one of the mRNA vaccines seems to be preferable. That's according to the US CDC. There are certain individuals, for example, the first individual who's immune compromised. For them, we're now in a place in the United States and have been where folks who are immune compromised may actually benefit from getting a fourth dose. So even though I know that individual has reached out to their healthcare provider, there are guidelines from the US CDC for what to do in that situation. Getting a third dose to begin with is among those, but that really is something that the physician who manages their immune compromised position will be best able to help them navigate. All right, um, so many questions coming in, but we are gonna take another quick break. We are speaking with Dr. Nira Shah, the director of Maine's CDC. We'll be right back. Listener support brings us Maine Calling with help from Central Maine Healthcare, now offering telehealth visits for both primary and specialty care. New patients welcome cmhc.org. I'm Scott Tong. A documentary producer marks a half century of asking deep and difficult questions inspired by this one. How do we hold on to our humanity in these times of relentless change and daunting challenge? Producer David Freudberg, next time on Here and Now. Here and Now, coming up shortly after Maine Calling from 12 noon until 2, here on Maine Public Radio. As the first African-American female judge to serve on the Superior Court in Northern California, LaDoris Cordell saw a lot in her five decades in courtrooms. Join us this week to hear about the law and racial injustices, LGBT rights, and more on the next Commonwealth Club radio program. Coming up this afternoon at 2 o'clock here on Maine Public Radio. Welcome back. I'm Jennifer Rooks. You're listening to Maine Calling. Today on the program, Dr. Neera Shah, Maine CDC Director. Join our conversation. Call 1-800-399-3566. Send a brief email to talk at mainepublic.org, tweet at Maine Calling, or post a comment to our Facebook page or to Instagram. We'll go to Whitney calling from Falmouth. Hi, Whitney. Go ahead. Hi, good morning, Dr. Shaw. Uh, first, I wanted to uh, commend you for your great tweet series on the weather industrial complex this weekend. That was a lot of fun. Um, I did want to ask about mask mandates. And, you know, some states still have them. Others are, you know, actively legally resisting them. Um, Maine is now having a patchwork. And I've heard anecdotally that some sort of people who feel more comfortable shopping with everyone being masked are diverting their business to a town with it. Whereas towns without them are in some ways attracting residents of the, you know, of their own hometown that, that has a mask mandate because they would rather go to a gym, et cetera, um, in a town that does not have a mask mandate. So I'm just, I'd love to hear your comment on whether there is a place for them still and, and what an ideal model might look like to you. Thank you. It's a very, very good question. And it's, it's one that, it comes up quite a bit and it's something that we discuss quite a lot here with our team at the main CDC. You know, so you're right. Um, different, different towns and cities have adopted mask mandates on their own, something that we certainly support. Uh, Governor Mills has noted and, and voiced her support for that local level decision making, um, certainly since the U.S. CDC paused its approach toward making uniform rules. And I, too, recommend in the strongest possible terms, that 
every single person who is going out to any indoor public setting anywhere in Maine, whether you are in a jurisdiction that has a mask mandate or one that doesn't, throw on a mask. We've also talked recently about upgrading your masks. I think these days a surgical mask is really the bare minimum. If you feel compelled to upgrade to a KN95, even better. So that's just the baseline. But to answer your question on the mandate piece, you know, my, my view on this is, 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 is as follows. In, in an era where we have spectacularly effective vaccines that are available with boosters, um, I, I think we have to really question whether the mandate is going to get us where a mandate would get us where we want to go. And here's the pro and con of that. On the pro side, Omicron does spread much more quickly. And so even incidental interactions in indoor public settings raise the possibility, I don't wanna call it the likelihood, but the possibility of there being some sort of transmission event. On the other side though, it continues to be the case because of the case investigations we're doing by the by, that much of the transmission that we are detecting happens in areas where a mask mandate would not necessarily be operative. Homes, places of that nature. So net of net, given that it would require an enforcement mechanism, which we all contended with earlier on, uh, we, we have not gone out with a mask mandate. Uh, I think now that we are starting to see a diminution in cases, uh, both positive reported cases, as well as other metrics like wastewater, the case for a uniform mask mandate is not what it was before, but that's just my own personal view. And of course, things can change. But right now, in light of the fact that the vaccines we have are stunningly effective, that's where we are putting our focus. Whitney, thanks for your call and question. I have a tweet here. Heard several stories of a spouse or roommate getting COVID, but not the other. Are fully vaccinated and boosted at-home tests used. Does this happen frequently and any idea why? Yes, it happens quite a bit. And it is a, and I'm gonna assume in your question or in the, in, the, in the person's question that the folks we're talking about were vaccinated. And in fact, someone who's very, very close to me was just caring for uh, a, a, a parent of theirs uh, who tested positive for COVID. And this person did not know that for a bit of time. And this person is fully vaccinated and boosted and did not get COVID from their parent, nor did they transmit it to anybody else in their household. This is a testament to just how good the vaccines are. Now, I know that there are folks who say, well, wait a minute. If the vaccines are so good, I know someone who got COVID and had a breakthrough case. That's right. Breakthrough cases can happen. Vaccines do not eliminate the risk of there being transmission. That remains a possibility in the same way that seat belts don't eliminate your risk of having a car accident. What the vaccines do is, a, is reduce the likelihood of something bad happening if you do get COVID in the same way that seat belts reduce the likelihood of something bad happening to if you do get into an accident. This possibility, this phenomenon of a roommate having COVID, but their other roommate not getting it. Is in, fun is in part, in large part, a function of just how good the vaccines are. We'll go to Rosie calling from Wyndham. Hi, Rosie, go ahead. Hi, uh, Dr. Shaw. Thank you so much for these updates and your briefings and your commitment to the, to the people of Maine. Um, my wife and I are both vaccinated and boosted, and uh, we were just wondering about the uh, next stage in the recommended booster whether that is on the horizon for people over 65 in Maine? And if so, what are the, uh, what are the recommendations around when someone should get that? And, and Rosie, thanks for your question. I want to tell you, Dr. Shaw, we have several questions coming in, people wondering when, when is going to be time for the next booster. Mm -hmm. Well, Rosie, thank you. It's very thoughtful of you to say. And here's where we stand with the possibility of there being, quote, the next booster, booster the fourth dose. Um, there have been a couple of countries that have started studying the effectiveness of a fourth dose. 
And we've also now have better data on just how good that first booster, the third dose really is. And both signs of data right now, and I wanna underline the right now piece, because this could change. But both of those strands of data are pointing toward the vaccines and boosters we currently have being spectacularly effective and a fourth dose not necessarily adding too much more onto that for those who don't have any kind of immune system problems. That could all change. Who knows what's coming down the pike? But based on where we are right now, the opinion of the US CDC and the US FDA appears to be that a fourth dose, a second booster, is not something that's needed at this moment in time. That could change. And that is, again, in part because of how well the third dose, the, your, your first booster is doing, plus the fact that the fourth dose, that next one, doesn't seem to add any marginal value. That could absolutely change based on what the next variant looks like. So stay tuned. Final point, the main CDC does not control that decision. That is a decision controlled by the US FDA and the US CDC, not the states. Rosie, thanks for your question. An email here from Andrew, who is a minister. Do you have any guidance for churches and community music groups about the safety of singing together indoors? Is it all right if all or most are vaccinated and all are masked? It's been hard to find clear guidance on this since 2020. You know, if we were talking in July, my answer would be one thing, which is move that move choir practice outside. Uh, I know that that is not feasible right now. Um, so uh, this question has certainly come up both about congregations themselves meeting for services and then particularly with choir practice. Um, choir practice raises the stakes a bit more. It's important. I absolutely understand the importance of being able to get together and practice as well as worship in that manner. Don't get me wrong. The choir practice raises the stakes though. It is um, effectively propelling the virus from someone who may have it as far and wide as possible. Now, if everyone in the choir is fully vaccinated and fully up to date with their booster, that lowers the risk quite a bit. But as with my answer, I think the first question about whether a family could go out to eat there is no one size fits all answer anymore because the notion of there being something being safe is not a binary or dichotomous concept anymore. Safety for now and for the time that we will be contending with COVID, which is a long time, safety will exist on a continuum. So, sir, if, you're, if your congregation is on the younger side, you don't have anyone who's immune compromised or they themselves don't have any family members who are immune compromised, then yes, choir practice with a fully boosted choir, uh, uh, choir and chorus could be something that's safe. But if your congregation skews older with folks who have pre-existing health conditions that have been contending with cancer or a kidney transplant, choir practice may introduce more risks. We're on this continuum where each of us is going to have to gauge the value of the thing that we want to do with the risk of COVID. We'll go to Janet calling from Kenny Bunk. Hi, Janet, go ahead. Hi, I was just wondering how Maine is doing with the flu this year. What a great question, Janet, because first of all, it's a reminder that although we talk about COVID, there are a bunch of other infectious diseases out there, respiratory ones like the flu, which I'll talk about, as well as others that are affecting kids like RSV, which really came back earlier in the summer. Now, flu rates in Maine, as well as in the country, are lower than they were last year. That's a good sign. But last year was interesting. We all but just squashed the flu altogether last year. I think in part because of how much social distancing and uniformity of mask wearing there was. This year, the flu is still below 2019 and 2016 levels. That's a good thing but it's not as low as it was last year. It's there, it's out there, it is circulating. We're seeing it in hospitals, we're seeing it in individuals. If you haven't gotten your flu shot yet, it is not too late. The flu season extends until March, sometimes into April. So if you have not gotten your flu shot yet, it is absolutely not too late. 
that would be a great thing to do this week if you haven't done so. Janet, thanks for your question. Um, let's see here. We'll go to Jessica calling from Lincolnville. Hi, Jessica, go ahead. Yeah, hi. I have a question about, um, well, my daughter um, is in preschool. There are recently some cases in her class, and then they shut down the whole school for um, beyond the recommended, the CDC recommended guidelines, which I believe are five days. It was, um, they closed for 10 days, um, not school days, but 10 full days. And I guess my question is, they seem to be, obviously these kids are unvaccinated, they're young, um, but they seem to be operating as if it's March or April 2020, um, whereas we have, you know, the rest of, I walk around town, restaurants are open, people are going um, into stores without masks, and I'm curious, preschools and daycares um, seem to be shutting down um, at a very high rate, causing yeah, Jessica, I'm going to wrap you up because we're really tight on time. Just about a minute and a half left and or a minute left. And Dr. Shaw, we also have a question from a, a mom of a seven month old who is being super cautious with her seven month old. So really parents of young children with a question about uh, guidelines at this point. Parents of young children are certainly concerned about COVID because the vaccines for their, for their kids may be still weeks, months away. So that concern is absolutely understandable. And I hear where it comes from. Jessica, you're right. The U.S. CDC not long ago, I'm sorry, the main CDC uh, a, a, about a week ago, uh, in recognition of the concerns around kids not being able to be in child care and daycare, we aligned our recommendations for kids and caretakers to be in line with those for adults, which is to say five days. Now, every daycare, every preschool may go about it differently based on their caution level. But we made those changes at the, at the main level. The US CDC came in behind us and effectively affirmed them because we understand and appreciate the value of kids being in the classroom. Uh, it is not easy. A lot of schools have had a lot of staff members out which have compelled longer closures. So it's not easy right now, but our priority continues to be to get kids in the classroom and keep them there safely. Maine has shown that we can do so. Thank you so much for your call, Jessica. It is going to be our last question. And as always, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Nero Shaw, Director of the Maine CDC. Today's sound engineer, Sandra Harris. Additional help, of course, from Nick Godfrey and Nick Woodward. Maine Calling is produced by Cindy Hahn and Jonathan Smith. Tomorrow on the program, tune in to hear our earlier show about green building in Maine. I'm Jennifer Rooks, and you have been listening to Maine Calling on Maine Public Radio.